Tonight we go to the book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel to chapter 6. And there we will find words that I am certain will fall well within our theme when God steps in. I begin with verse 16. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him. And the king could not sleep. Let's bow together as we pray. Father in heaven, tonight we come again wanting to see the power that is yours when you choose to step in. Our hearts are open tonight, for these are times that need the presence of God. Certainly a nation needs God, and certainly neighborhoods need God, but tonight our focus is for our own lives. We need God to step into our own hearts. Now as we go through these words tonight that are sacred, we pray that our hearts might be lifted and that our minds might be enlightened. In the name of Jesus, amen. The situation is one that most of us are fairly sure we know. Daniel is a holdover from another kingdom. He is a holdover from Babylonia. And you would suspect that uh, when the time comes for the Medes and the Persians to put together their alliance, that most of the talent pool would be expected to come from within. In fact, try if you can not to put the Bible outside of normal range. There are the same human elements in this book that exist right now. Can you imagine if one nation had ruled and now another comes to the stage that most of the people who had supported the government, who had supported those who had come into power, would expect that when positions were filled, those positions would be filled by the ones who gave support. Can you imagine the dismay when somebody suggests that this man held over from another time, another period, another power structure is going to be brought in now to fill a very high position. Think, if you will, that everybody was happy. But I can tell you this, you may get smiles and warm handshakes from people when you are promoted, but everybody is never happy when you're the one and they are not. <laughs> so in the hallways, you know, I want to say there was a water fountain, you know there wasn't, but you understand, don't you? When they gathered around to talk, somebody probably brought it up. It was a ticklish subject, but someone had to say it. And why is Daniel that old has been? <laughs> Why again? Hasn't he seen his time? You know, the young people want to say, get the old folk out of the way and move on. And then there are some nationalists who must have been around. How dare we bring someone whose customs are different? Why, we don't even know what these people are like. And yet, we bring this man and put him high on the list. I read that... Uh, the country, the nation was divided into what they called satrapies. And these satraps were people called to keep order, to make sure that there was no anarchy, but most importantly, to make sure that the revenue flowed smoothly. All governments run on revenue. 
And they wanted to make sure that there, was, there were no social uprisings, that nobody withheld taxes. So they said everything as quietly and as calmly as they could. But now a moment comes when not only will this Daniel be listed among those who are high in government, but they are considering him to be the first among the princess. Ah, that's a different story. You know, we, we'll be open-minded enough to have him part, but how dare you put him over me? Someone must have made an impassioned plea to Darius. How could you do it? I feel stabbed in the back. Where was Daniel when you were trying to consolidate power? Where were these people? How dare you? But the Bible is clear that Daniel had an excellent spirit. You know, it's kind of hard to find people with an excellent spirit anymore. I, I think that if God is in your heart, if you have dedicated yourself to serve the Almighty, there certainly ought to be some way to prove it. I heard one preacher say, uh, you ought to ask the question, if you are accused of being a Christian, would there be enough information, would there be enough evidence to indict you? If people followed you from day to day, you know how they do, gathering evidence, would it be possible for someone to prove by looking at the way you conduct your life that you serve a God who is invisible? Well, when you looked at Daniel, you could tell there was something different about him. In fact, one writer says that not only was this Daniel a man with an excellent spirit, but you could find no flaws in the way that he conducted business. Ah, now that's quite different. There are people who are able to separate their religion from normal life. In fact, you've heard people say it. <laughs> if you keep on with me, I'm going to put my religion down. You know, portable religion isn't of much value at all, is it? <laughs> if you put it down, what in the world are you doing with it? But Daniel obviously did not only allow his love for God and his quest for excellence to be a part of his religious life, his worship, but he let it bleed over into everything that he did. So that when he was the one in charge of a project, you could assume that all of the dots would be over the I's and all the T's would be crossed because that's the kind of administrator he was. So when they began to talk about putting him up, uh, people could make all kinds of snide remarks and they could level all kinds of criticisms, but the one thing they couldn't say and the one thing you don't read is, he's not qualified. <laughs> it's amazing. When people can't find that you're not qualified, they look elsewhere. But I would like to think, <laughs> in fact, I, I, I want to believe that at some point in my life, I could rise to the point where the only thing that my enemies could say about me is that I'm faithful to my God. Here was a man, and, and believe me, if they could have gone back through his dossier, don't think that somebody wasn't left over from Babylonia, some sore head left over from Babylonia who said, you talk to me, I know him. I said, well, let's talk. Let's do lunch, you know. So they go now to do a power lunch. And the object of their conversation is, tell me about this, Daniel. What's the scoop on Daniel? Oh, I can tell you about it. Well, what is it? We, the man has got to have some flaw. Everybody's got some problem. What is it? Well, if this man were wise, he would go all the way through the lunch before he came to the bottom line because he would hope they picked up the check before they discovered he had nothing to say. There was nothing to dig up on Daniel. In fact, if all of the people who had asked him to serve were brought together, the only accusation that they could level was he's true to his God. So, so when they looked at the records, when they searched the dossier, when they looked at the historical record, and when they wanted to know what kind of reputation does he have, nobody could come up with anything on him. I wouldn't dare 
turn that around to us in this room. Because then everyone would get nervous. <laughs> because for most of us, that just can't be said. But here's a man who serves his God so well that he is meticulous in the way that he does his job. I think it's the way that it ought to be. If you claim to be like Christ, you ought to be like Christ all the time, even in the job that you do. So now, what will you do if you want to stop a person from being placed in an office, but you can find no place to put blame on them? Well, you know, all you've got to do is get creative. So you mean you have evaluated everything, and what do they say? Well, we had to power lunch with the guy from Babylonia. All he could come up with was the man worships his God. Is that so? Well, what do you know about it? Well, we've checked with everyone, and all of the witnesses speak with one voice. The only thing that they can find out different about him is that he believes in this God. It's different than the way that we worship but he certainly will not change his pattern for anyone. Well, I wonder, my quandary is, how could we turn this very faithfulness against it? Some evil mind begins to turn in the back of a room. Well, suppose, let me just speak theoretically. Suppose it could be arranged so that his fidelity to his God could become a liability rather than an asset. Well, how do you do that? What do they say he does with his God? Well, as we understand it, at the third, the sixth, and the ninth hour, he leaves his place of work and goes home. Uh, in those days, they claim that Mesopotamian houses uh, would often have one room elevated from the rest of the flat-roofed house, and this probably was the prayer room. So that in Daniel's situation, he would go into the elevated room, if there were such. He would turn towards the direction of Jerusalem and open the window. Now, you know that when you pray, you don't have to open a window. That it was not obviously for the sake of God, for God hears prayers through closed windows. God hears prayers in any situation. You can be at the bottom of the water in a great fish. God will hear the prayer. But Daniel was so dedicated and so intentional in his worship of his God that he didn't want anybody to have any doubts about who he was. I praise God for people like this because there are so many folks today who you can't tell what they're about. You know, the chameleon people. They are whatever you are. As soon as they find out who you are, well, yes, I, I quite agree. And when you leave, they agree with the next person. And the next person, their whole lives are spent adjusting to the ambiance in the room. There ought to be somebody who believes in something. Daniel was defiant in his decision. He would worship the God of heaven and he wanted people to know that there was a difference in him. And so he went and opened the window towards Jerusalem and there he prayed. And they said, this is what we've discovered, that he will leave the office. And he well, said, you know, maybe there's something in that. There, perhaps we can make something of it. His customs are different. What else did you find? Well, we discovered that there are some differences in the way that he dresses. His diet is not quite like ours. Uh, this man has customs that don't blend. He's, he's, he doesn't fit in. He's not a team player. If we could get this maniacal obsession of his about this God away. He might even fit in, but he won't. I said, well then, why don't we use that against him? Well, come on, how can you use that against him? Sounds to me like a good thing. Well, suppose, just, just suppose. 
Suppose our king were to say that no one can pray to anyone except him for 30 days. <laughs> well, that's absurd. Why would the king ever say that? Well, I wasn't thinking that the king would say it on his own. I was thinking that perhaps someone could uh, maybe incline him to take a position like that. And if we, we stroked him in the correct way, you know the king does have a fairly healthy ego. Perhaps we could cajole him. Perhaps he could see light in being worshipped for 30 days. Now, let me show you what I missed for the longest about this. What they will try to get the king to say and finally be successful at is to say that you cannot pray to any god or any man for 30 days except the king. Essentially, stopping all prayer for a month. Do you know what kind of shape the world is in with prayer? It is mind-boggling to think that you would stop prayer for a month. I don't know about you, but there have been some times in my life when for whatever reason I have allowed my prayer life to, to have gaps. And I've discovered that when I don't pray, my life is different. Prayer is, is the breath that I breathe. It is the connection with God. How can you make it without prayer? There are problems that you can face with prayer. Even though God may not determine to take the problem away, God will give you the strength to stand up under the pressure if you pray. But how in the world would you make it without prayer? For a month, how could you make it a day without prayer? This maniacal obsession that they cite now makes them move in a way that does not make sense at all. Well, allow me now, I have not been able to read anything or find anything on this, but I have prayed that God will baptize my imagination. <laughs> allow me, if you will, to guess at what it might have been like when these men go in to talk to the king. Oh, King Darius, the majesty of your presence, sir. Forgive us, but in your presence we are hesitant to even speak. <laughs> Why, just before we came in, we were saying, weren't we, how blessed we are. <laughs> no one anywhere, no nation on the face of the earth, can boast a man with such wisdom, with such insight. And beyond that, if you would allow us to say, a man whose countenance is so fair to look upon. Forgive us, Your Honor. Your Highness, we know that you are not a man who likes this kind of thing, but sometimes our hearts bubble over. Please understand. Now, we have brought you. <laughs> We have brought you an idea. We were trying to think of some way that we could let it be known far and wide that you are far and above any other potentate. Could we, sir, don't speak too quickly, don't turn us away out of hand. Could we, sir, for, for just the period of a month, pray only to you and to no one else? Think about it. Many a person has been caught in a situation just like this. There are some men who allow women. <laughs> to tell them things that they know are not true. I thank God for mirrors, don't you? Before you leave home, you are able to look at yourself and remind yourself what you look like. 
Brother, when a woman comes up to you and says, oh, huh, you are so muscular. And you know the last time you pumped iron, you were in your teens. And now most of your muscularity has given way to gravity. And yet you will allow some woman to tell you things that you know are not true. And in the, the warmth, the basking of the moment, do something or say something or commit to something that does not make sense. And ladies, you enjoyed that, but you know <laughs> those sweet nothings. Oh, I look at you. And you know, you just check the mirror, folks. <laughs> check the mirror. You can be safe. Look, just look. Oh, your eyes. You know, you've seen your eyes all of your life. Oh, they just dance with lights. Now you're about to do something very foolish. There are people who get into all kinds of trouble because somebody says the right words in the right way. They may be so far from the truth that it's ridiculous. But here is a king about to do something silly. Well, I, uh, I really should think on it. But your highness, it's something that you need to do. Let's grasp the moment. Our hearts bubble over. Allow us, please. Just if you would have fixed your, your signet here. We'll take care of all of the, the details. We, we could have it done, sir, before the day's over. And all of the people would rise up as one and praise us for this gesture that we're about to give you. Would you, sir, just give it to me, sir. Let me do it. The wax, someone. And you just have it done. We have it here. We prepared it. It's all done. Would you like to read it or would you trust us? <laughs> and now it's done. Now, don't think that Daniel is so naive that he doesn't know. If you're going to be in government, You've got to have an information system. Huh? Forgive me, this is, this is not strictly biblical, but it does make sense. You've got to be aware of what's going on. This move by the king reverberates all over now, and the word is out. The king has signed a document that says you cannot pray to any god or any man for 30 days. And Daniel, in his heart, has to decide what Will I do? Will I? You know how we rationalize God. Well, God would certainly want me to keep this position. Um, after all, I am here representing him. And if I pray openly, I will lose the position. So in the long run, it would really serve God's purposes more for me to stay than to be put out. So what would it hurt for 30 days if I were to simply pray quietly in the office. How many times have you done that in your own heart? <laughs> well, I, I know what's right, but God wouldn't want me to, to, to really misrepresent him. But Daniel does not make that decision, knowing full well that they're watching. In fact, maybe because they're watching. When the third hour from sunrise, let's suppose it's around nine, they're watching now. Let's see what he does. <laughs> see what strong man Daniel's going to do now. And he leaves his office, goes home. I said, well, a lot of people follow. Oh, yeah, we follow. We got him on him. And they're watching. <laughs> see if the window's open now. You don't think he's going to do that, do you? Well, the window's open. You see him? There he is. Oh, this is going to be easy. <laughs> there he is, praying. Well, okay. You know, he's, he's going to make this, he's going to fall into the trap. And at the, at the sixth hour and at the ninth hour, he's there. And they observe him and they take down the notes and they make sure that it's all documented. They have established a paper trail. You know, when you go to the king, you can't go empty-handed. 
So someone has it there. So they've got to get, okay, do you have everything listed? Let's not just do it one day. Let's, let's watch him a little longer. We don't have exactly the time, but, but let's watch him. And Daniel is there exactly on time. He does not change anything. When he prays, he opens the window and prays towards Jerusalem. And his prayer is open and above board. I suggest to you that when you lose your sensibility and when you make a silly decision, you will discover that people's attitudes change. As long as you hold to what's right. They may not like you, but they respect you. King has heard all of this foolishness, all of this ambrosiaized talk, this sweet talk. Now all of a sudden these people change. They are no longer friends of his, but now their language is abrupt. Their movements are nefarious. They are now calculating and cold in what they do. They go and check Daniel and finally one Commentator says that they even waited until a moment when Daniel was praying and broke in unexpectedly and knocked at his door to make sure that he was there praying. And if Daniel answered, says this commentator, then they went in on him to make sure, what were you doing? And he did not hide that he was praying to God Almighty. For when you have God on your side, you don't have to hide from anybody. Now, now they're ready. Uh, King, uh, you, you remember we were here the other day with the little thing you signed? We got a problem. This man, Daniel, that you want to promote all the time. Did we mention the other day that he's not like us? Well, I think we did. Uh, we have here a, a bill of particulars. You know, if it were now, it would be a computer printout. Uh, the surveillance report, reconnaissance now. And somebody would have unfolded those little papers that are green on one line and white on the other. And they'd pull them. Uh, here are all of his movements. As you can see, sir, uh, the rule, the law specifically says no prayer to any God or man except you. And here, just follow that down. You see, this is an open flaunting of our law. And, and I think, do we have to remind you, sir, that here, once you sign and affix your seal, even you, your highness, cannot change the law. Now, the historians say that the Chaldeans were different. They gave their rulers both the authority to make law and to take it back. If you're going to have human beings rule over you, you ought to give them the ability to change bad law. Huh? <laughs> we are close enough just now to the capital of the United States of America to be able to say that with some authority. You ought to have the ability to write law and to rescind law. So if you're going to ask of any one human being to rule with power, then you ought to give that person the power both to make law and to take it back. The Chaldeans did. The Medes did not. The Persians, the Medes and the Persians decided when the king makes the law, he ought to have enough foresight. He ought to have enough wit about him that when he makes a rule, we ought to live with it. So they would not allow the king to have the ability to withdraw bad law. So when they had him committed, he was in and could not extract himself. So now they come and hoist him on the horns of his own dilemma. They tell him now, sir, you cannot change. Here is your law. And here is someone who has flaunted your law. Now the rule says, the codicil here says that we must take such a person and dispose of that person by throwing them into the den of lions. You have been to the zoo to see lions. I, uh, I've had the privilege of traveling to Africa uh, several times and I teased them on most of my trips that the wildest animal that I had seen on the continent of Africa was a goat. And the word got out. So on one of my trips to Zimbabwe, someone came to me after my last speaking engagement and they said, Pastor Pearson, word has reached us that you say 
that the wildest animal that you have seen on the continent is a goat. Is that so, sir? I'm feeling a little bit like Darius now. <laughs> Possible that I said something like that. <laughs> I said, well, Elder, we are about to change that situation. In fact, if we get in the car, we've already packed your luggage. We're about to take you to a game reserve, and at this one, Pastor, the animals are free, and the people must stay inside. Well, you know, I, I didn't want to seem like I was not up to it. <laughs> so I get in the car. It's actually one of those strange rover type vehicles, not the Land Rover, that would have been much nicer. And we're, we're riding forever, it seems. And at length, we come at the end of the day to a place where we drive inside the gates and they shut the gates and about two minutes in, a lioness turned on the road, would not move. You should have seen her. <laughs> she had an attitude of ownership. She turned and looked like, what are you doing here? The man stopped the car. The lioness froze for just a moment to punctuate her ownership. And when she had proven her point, she walked slowly majestically over to the other side and look back at us as to say, now you may pass. <laughs> and they said to me, this is gonna be good. The lions are out. <laughs> we, uh, we went that night to the little, little house where you, where you go in. I checked everything. I, I was just being careful for my wife She wasn't there, and I knew she wanted me to return. <laughs> check the windows, doors, just check. And then they said, look, let, let's go sit outside and eat. They don't know it, but I carefully positioned my chair so that I had instant egress into the house. Ingress, I should say. In and we sat there talking, and they were talking, and I'm eating, and if you think that a lion in a zoo sounds frightening, you don't know what a lion is like. In the zoo, the losers are there. These are lions that got caught. These lions are bemoaning their situation. These, you think they sound horrible, these lions are, are weary and sad, they are bored, they're sick. I heard noises that I had never heard before. My blood curdled as I listened. I said, what uh, was, what was that? Uh, <laughs> lion pasta. I said, would you think you heard one lion? No, there are more, there, there must be many of them. We heard them and I said, okay. Now, think of it. In those days, the, some of the historians think that if you wanted to impress an emperor or a ruler, you would bring that person some animal that betokened their qualities. It would be contraindicated to bring a king a chicken. <laughs> but people would bring animals that bespoke power. And if you wanted to bring someone, some animal to, to impress a high ruler, you would bring them a, an animal that had those qualities. Now, when you think of it, the lion, I, I, I did my little research, Panthera Leo, the cat family, Philidae, king of the beasts, with the exception of one tiger, the largest carnivorous mammal on the face of the earth, nine feet sometimes from nose to tail, tawny yellow, powerful and unpredictable. And there I am outside with <laughs> these animals. 
And it made me think the next time I preach this sermon, it'll be different. Because these are not animals that have been caught in some zoo. They have been caught and put down in a cave, a hole in the ground and a rock put over them. That is even worse than a zoo where they can look out and see the terrible plight that they have. Now these, these animals are locked in the bosom of the earth. The king of beasts insulted. They can't wait to change that situation. And I imagine that sometimes when the king would get bored, he might go and look and they'd toss some big piece of meat in there. But these lions had not been fed for a long time. And now they say to him, your friend Daniel, sir, we will take now and put into this den of lions. And when we take him, and there's every reason to believe that Daniel at this point in his life might have been at least 90 years of age, some would suggest perhaps even older, but it makes no difference what your age is. If they're about to drop you into a chasm that is filled with hungry lions. And so they take the old man and suspend him for a moment of enjoyment as the king stands by, having done all that he can for a whole day with all of his law staff working frantically, trying to get a loophole to get him to be able to change the law of the Medes and the Persians, but he cannot. Now he comes to the moment when he has to go down and not only put Daniel inside this chasm and roll the rock back, but he must now take his signet and the signet of the other rulers so that even the king cannot sneak back, open the lion's den, take him out and seal it again. All of them put their signet there. So the Bible says they did it so that nobody could change Daniel's situation. My question is simple. Why didn't God stop that before that happened? Do you know how powerful God is? Your heart beats because of the power of God. Oh, I know, the physicians will be quick to point out that, that this muscle has been put there in your chest and, and, and it does not need your thought process. Your heart does not wait for you to think for it to beat. This muscle has been set in motion from birth and, and, and in a real sense, God has given us the power to have hearts that beat. But God's power is the one that set it in motion. The Bible says in him we live and move and have our being and I believe that life is sustained by God. I believe that life is a gift from God. God would have had the power to withdraw life from all of those enemies, to frighten them, to cause some cataclysmic event, to make an earthquake, to cause a media to fly out of nowhere. God could have done anything to stop it before it got this far. So why does God let trouble go that far? Why would God let a man be dropped into a den of hungry lions? Why would God let it go this far? My answer is simple. If he hadn't, you'd have never read it. Huh? Now, who would have put that in the Bible? Uh, there is a rumor that people were angry with Daniel. It is thought that they might have done something terrible, but they changed their minds. Nah. Nah. There's nothing in that. But in order for God to show that he's God, God has to wait until there's no other way to explain what he does. He's got to wait until you can't explain away his power. Because how many times have you done it? God opens the way for some cousin to give you back some money that they've owed you for five years. And instead of giving God the glory, you say, oh, I'm so happy my cousin came through. When God sent your cousin the impulse to give you back what you had. There are people who give credit to the credit union. 
I went to the credit union and because I've been working down there, they gave me a loan. Well, based on your credit, you should have gotten nothing even though you work there. Even though they can take it out of your check, you shouldn't have gotten a loan, but God opened the way. And yet, you don't give credit to God, you give credit to the credit union. You go down to buy a car. You're not supposed to be able to buy a car. Your credit report almost made the computer get warm. But God got tired of watching you riding in that car of yours that starts when it gets ready. And so God arranged. Huh? You know that little room they put you in where there's no air conditioning? And you're sitting in there. Lord, please, please send away, you know, the car. And you, you got it all fixed up, put that thick oil in it and brought it down there and prayed that it would run until they looked at it. And they gave, looked at it and told you how much they give you for it. And now they're checking your credit and you can hear that music playing. And what am I going to do? But you're trying to make your face not show it. And finally, they come back in and say, uh, sir, uh, everything checked out fine. And you want to shout, but you can. You've got to act like this is normal. But you're wondering, what, whose credit report did they check? Am I actually going to have this car? And, and watch it now. You get in the car now. When you first get in, oh, how you praise God. Praise God, look at me. How messed up. Drive by a big window somewhere so you can see it. Hallelujah, look at this. You're praising God until you kind of get used to it. Now it is no longer a blessing from God. Somebody asked, hey, how'd you get that car? Well, you know, I, uh, I know a little bit about business. And, uh, you know, I just, I've always been able to work things out. I mean, it's, it's just something the second, uh, my dad was able to do that, my mother, is like that. You know, that's, that's, that's able to do it. So what God has to do is to take away all your excuses and get him some glory. And when you drop somebody in a lion's den, how many know that all of the excuses are gone? No more excuses. Drop you down there. The lion's supposed to be waiting. You know, it's getting ready to be some feeding time in here. But Daniel said, God sent his angel. <laughs> you know, I, forgive me, but I get excited when this stuff happens. You know? <laughs> Drop you down by a lion, and you know, you almost feel it happening because you, know you know what you're going to feel next, right? And the lion comes up, with that ugly sound, but he can't get his mouth open because some angel. You know, maybe the angel didn't even have to hold him. The angel just said, You may not obey God, but a lion knows what to do. Amen? Now watch this, watch this. King, king goes back to the palace. Can't eat. No entertainment. King, you want us to, no, music. My friend is down there in that lion's den. Up at the palace, the king can't sleep. While down in the lion's den, it is possible, Psalm 127 says that God gives his children sleep. When you go to sleep at night, it is not because of some pharmaceutical preparation. See, the sleeping pill can knock you out, but only God gives sleep. You can take something to make you unconscious. Then in the morning, you got to take something to wake you up, but only God gives sleep. So it is possible, say the commentators, that Daniel had a better night's sleep in the lion's den than the king had in the palace. 
And I suggest to you that when God steps in, it doesn't make any difference where you live. It doesn't make any difference what you have. It doesn't make any difference what they think of you. If God be for you, so, so, so God can step in to your situation where you are. God does not have to pull you out of your tenement and put you in a penthouse to make you blessed. God can bless you where you are. God doesn't have to give you a man to bless you. In fact, if you get the wrong man, you wish God had not blessed you like that. God can bless you alone, sister. He can do more for you alone without than the wrong man could do if he were there. And you, brother, are you listening to me? We try to ask God for things and then tell God how to do it. Let God decide on his own delivery system. God could have kept Daniel out of the den of lions, but he put him there so that you could know that when you are surrounded by lions, like on your job, You know you got some lions at work, don't you? You know, come by your office. Huh? There are some lions in some houses. There are relatives who are lions. Somebody in here may be married to a lion. I know a God who can shut the lion's mouth. In fact, it's sad, but sometimes you go to church and the lions are in church. I know I've been a pastor for almost 30 years. I've been around a few members who were lions and I said, Lord, please, you did it once. Do it again. God can do for you what he needs to do wherever you are. He does not have to change your location to give you his blessing. God is able where you are to bless you. You say, God, I need some money. God said, let me skip money. I'll just give you what you need. <laughs> Lady came to me in a church. She said, Pastor, I need a warm coat. I said, let's pray. You know, okay, I'll pray. So you got faith or not? Well, I said, well, if you don't have faith, we don't waste time pray. Huh? He that cometh to God must believe that he is. That he's a reward of them that diligently see. If you don't have faith, quit wasting your time. Look at television. She said, okay, okay, I'm gonna have faith. We got down on our knees and prayed. Lady went to the place, didn't have a great job. She was taking care of a, of, of a house for a while and she was mad about the job. God took the job she had. The lady who owned the house had worn the coat on this side of the pond and that side of the pond. It happened to be a certain kind of fur that was in vogue then. Now, you can't wear them now. Be careful now, folks will spray paint all over you and stuff. But in those days, it was, it was still acceptable. Went over, the lady said, look, have you seen that coat? She said, yes, I saw it. Said, well, you know, we, we can only wear them twice. Wear them in America, and then we wear them in Europe, and then you can't be seen in it again. Would you be so kind as to accept it? Come try it on. Put it on. Yeah, that kind of fits. Sister came to church. I said, well, hmm. <laughs> Last week we didn't have a coat, and now we got. What's going on? She said, You know what? You told me the Lord could skip money. She said, I don't have any more money now than I had last week, but. I'll tell you one thing that money can't buy, peace of mind. When Howard Hughes died, every book that I've ever read said that the man with all of his money was paranoid. Put down tissues and towels in every hotel room. His fingernails grew out like some animal and he had a bone, one book suggests, protruding from his body with all of his money frightened, riding in Chevrolets, hiding in darkness. Money will not buy you happiness, but when God steps in, he can skip money. 
give you whatever he wants you to have. King comes early in the morning. Got to finish. Got to close up. King can't sleep. Sun comes up. King said, let me go down here and see what happened. And with, a, with a voice that cracks, you know, when you haven't slept all night anyway. And Daniel, afraid to call, but afraid not to. Daniel, is your God able? Listen, stick, stick with me now. Don't miss, don't miss this. If Daniel had been frightened all night, he would not have been able to exchange platitudes in the cultural context. See? If you've been scared all night, you say, huh? <laughs> Daniel says, O oh, king, live forever. King live forever. That means that it wasn't a bad night. I don't know how you spent yours, but I'm all right. Got a little cool, but I laid on one of these lions over here. My Lord was able to shut the lion's mouth and brought them out. Now watch this, just in case the people get in there and say, well, see, what happened was the lions weren't hungry. King said, all you folk who got him in trouble, they said, don't worry, don't worry. He didn't eat Daniel, it's okay. Just, just, come on, let's go. Daniel's, ate, the lions ate them up. Now, watch, watch this. Gotta, gotta do this one before we close it. Daniel, what happened down there? My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth because, two reasons, check it, check me. I did the king no harm and innocency was found in me. Walter Pearson believes that Jesus Christ is the answer to every problem you face. 